this session altogether known the rise of the choir. My name is Niall Crowley. I'm uh, a freelance designer and also an um, amateur chorister, uh, choir singer with the uh, Opera Company and before that, Midlands Opera Company. Um, what we want to do in this session is look at the phenomenal rise of the choir and the rise of popularity over the last few years. Um, what, if anything, is so special or magical about choirs and choral singing? And also, we want to ask if there, uh, look at the health uh, and social benefits that many people claim um, that they can cure you know, all kinds of social, social and personal ills. Um, and examine that a little bit, you know, see whether that is something, whether it's true, whether it's worth doing. To help us do that, we've got five wonderful speakers from the world of music and music education to our uh, introduce in a moment. Uh, before I do that, I'd just like to say a little bit about the strand of arts discussions that we are, um, that this is part of. Um, it's run by the, the, the strand is sponsored by the um, Institute of Ideas Arts Group of the uh, run by Tiffany Jenkins and Wendy, Wendy Earl, I'm sure that they're, they're in the audience. Uh, they run a series of excellent, uh, sorry, monthly discussions in and around London and Bates book, uh, book discussions. Um, really worth checking out. So, the CD or, or um, anyone else has to look at it to find more about that. Um, I'll introduce the speakers in the order in which we are going to, to kick off. So, um, these are brief biographies because we have to keep it quite tight because the book is building is fast. <clears throat> First of all, on the left, we've got uh, Susie Bigby, who Susie is a music educator, choral conductor, um, founder of the London Youth Choirs, uh, Vocal Futures, Voices Foundation. She was a judge on BBC's Last Choir Standing and BBC Choir of the Year. In 2009, Susie received an OBE from the group for services to music education. Um, and next on the left is Roy Rosterley. Robin is the Chief Executive of Making Music, the leading body for amateur music uh, organisations in Britain. He's also the Director of the Association of Chief Executives of Voluntary Organisations and has held many other uh, posts uh, throughout the music world. Uh, on my right is uh, Professor Dave Linden. Dave is a tutor, uh, conductor, chorus master and eminent teacher of Kuday, is it? Could I, could I, musicianship at the Guildhall School of Music? The Guildhall are, are, are partners in this session, so we owe them a, a great debt of, of thanks. Um, he's the co founder of the Coudé Centre uh, of London. Uh, David has conducted many orchestral and uh, choral performances from the South Bank in London to the Tchaikovsky Hall in Moscow. Tessa Martin, to my session. My name is Ben sipping a tea, is a pianist and graduate of the Royal School of Music. Um, she's the founder of Music in Offices, a very interesting organisation that sets up choirs and organises music lessons for in workplaces around London, mainly in the city um, and, and elsewhere around the country. And she's also the co founder of the Surrey Hills Music Festival. Uh, and finally, on my far right, uh, is Dr. Kevin Young, who's a senior lecturer in history at the University of Sunderland. He researches 20th century American intellectual history and uh, contemporary use in American society, issues in American society. Sorry. Um, on his days off, he performs the second tenor in the Durham Rural Society. Um, <coughs> just a quick word about how this session was run, because it's a very um, uh, a, a very big, uh, a vast, complex of it, as people know with the, uh, the body. Uh, we're on the street to keep his time, so I'll shut up as quickly as I can. Uh, each speaker will get a, a, around six minutes, and uh, then we'll have a couple of questions uh, to cover in the session and try and get out to, um, to, to, to you, the audience, and have a, uh, a very good discussion. If you want to tweet during the discussion, the hashtag is that's another hashtag. Hashtag, by the way. And um, I think that's 
Yeah, we don't have a lot of surprises for you during the session. I'll just warn you now, so we'll get a couple of things. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, as for much of this discussion, we'll be focusing on the social impact. But I'd start by sharing with you something very special that happened to me recently. For the last few months, I've been laying the foundations for a brand new initiative called the London Youth Prize. And I was about to start the fundraising, but my husband came back and said, I found your funder. And I said, What do you mean you found your funder? And he said, Oh, someone bounced up to me yesterday and said, How Susie, what are you doing? And I told him about this new initiative, London Youth Prize, that, meant, that means to draw for all better three boroughs and different communities and stuff. And he said, I'll unfund it. And so, of course, I went to run to run to see him the next day, and he said, look, my wife and I have a foundation. We know nothing about music. We've never supported music. But I was in a hospital the other day, a national health hospital in London, and I looked at all the different languages in Arabic and everything, and I thought, what is there that is actually bringing these communities together? And I heard about your London Youth Choir project, and I would like to fund it. That's about the nicest day I've ever had in my entire life. So that is a quite an interesting um, uh, story, I think, for the purposes of what we're talking about. So I wanted to start the London Youth Choir for 20 years since my church and fellowship back in 1990, which took me around the world examining youth choral programs and singing cultures, but I needed the right person to work with. Um, and it took me 20 years to find the remarkable Rachel Staunton. Our second rehearsal was last week, and we had 200 children out of hundreds of audition from 30 of the 33 boroughs. Remarkable. And um, maybe if I'd started it sooner, we wouldn't have been able to access all of those children to all different cultures. Those 20 years have seen a fascinating renaissance of singing in communities and schools, culminating in the astonishing uh, 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 donation or gift of the Labour government of £40 million to singing in primary schools over the years, which I think must be precedented internationally in history, unprecedented internationally in history. Um, during those intervening 20 years, I devoted myself to creating and supporting singing communities, community, singing communities from schools for excluded, permanently excluded in inner city children to Cambridge colleges, and to using music via the medium of singing to make people feel better about themselves and enhance their lives. Some of that drive comes from a pure desire to make music and to give expression to the greatest art, uh, art achievements of mankind, the matter of passion, the desire, the core of music, both side driven. But much comes from the stronger, almost compulsive instinct that I've had to improve and transform the lives of others through group singing. And I've also needed to fulfill the musician in myself to make music at the highest level that I can as a trained musician through my conductor and concert power. So I've had a dual career. Career A as a choral conductor, career B, B as a music educator and lobbyist, convincing the nation that music should not be an option in early education and that requires matter. And that we should judge it with one politician as well, the TV inside. Um, I also set up a, a purely commercial organisation called Leading Voices that used to be called Arts Works, but more and more the companies want to sing it, which works with big multinationals, helping them tackle some of their leadership and team issues through singing. And this has really caught on, and uh, we'll have to hear a lot more about that from Tessa. Um, so I've been developing my ideas of effective leadership, of effective team building, and how leading a choir and performing a choir enlightens us in these areas of human dynamics. I've also spent decades, literally, examining the properties of communities where singing remains functional, what I call functional, to pass down your mother tongue in the face of political oppression, to unite against the opponent, a cry for freedom in the face of oppression, to express a common emotion, cultural identity, Worship, toil, sacred songs, ritual, disturb the mob, there's so many different functional uh, uh, uses of singing. Um, the rest is recreation, so there's functional recreation in my view. In Britain, we have virtually no functional singing left, except on football terraces. And, and it, they sing not because they're told to sing, but they sing because almost as a, as a need to sing, uh, to, to establish the identity of the different communities. But is, is, it, is singing becoming functional again in our society? Has the modern, this modern British choral renaissance of the last 20 years, which was triggered in the early 90s, opened doors for people to sing to survive or at least cope better? BBC One's Last Choir Standing, which, like all these cult TV reality choir programs, 
merely representing the crest of a wave that's been building for 20 years as a result of all our hard work below the radar, results in a 25% rise in the number of choirs. So there are now 25,000 registered choirs in the UK, as much as there are fish and chip shops. Um, uh, and uh, this is because the ordinary person at the council station was so many sorry, thought, if she can, I can. Um, in the mid-1990s, the Telegraph interviewed me for a whole page piece in the health section about health benefits of singing. And this triggered a thousand, in those days, faxes and telephone messages over the week, one single weekend. And I launched a series of Singing is Good for You Beach workshops all over the place. And we, we were still mopping that explosion of interest up five years later from that one Telegraph piece. So there were four different, there are actually four, six different society I work with through which I can examine the impact of groups. There's the uninitiated self-selected group, there's the uninitiated not self-selected, in other words, the three line group from the company director. So right, your team building today is singing. That's sort of always met with fear and skepticism. There's the out of choirs from basic to very high level, professional choirs, music making with children, music education with children, um, along the CODI principles of which David Vinton, Professor David Vinton is probably the UK's leading practitioner. Um, recent brain imagery and neuroscience has shown us that singing is a right brain activity, speech is a left brain activity. This demonstrated what many of us have known instinctively, that singing comes from a different place. In my view, it is innate. We sing before we speak, the brain can internalize pitch patterns much more naturally than speech, which is and I subscribe to the theory that music is one of our, our, our multiple intelligences. And singing is the most efficient and effective way to develop this in all children, not those just deemed to be the talented ones. Therefore, singing is in many ways our mother's milk. And it is incumbent on us that, to ensure that we maintain the extraordinary advancements of recent years um, and, uh, and learn from those lessons and what we've what we, um, acquired in the way. Really, they're very interesting. I think equally important uh, to all this is that we have a tradition, a tradition which is unique because we are the only country with a 500 year unbroken tradition of the choirs. France had more choirs than we did until the, the French Revolution. Um, this tradition is second to none worldwide, one of the few things left in which we are the unrivaled enemy of the world. Finally, this pyramid of excellence, crowned by our great cathedral choirs and the great professional choirs, um, is fed from the grassroots by the Voices Foundation, Mike Brewer, and the National Youth Choirs Rafford, and the Hall of Horses, which is not just eaten into this name, and institutions, including our choir competitions, etc. This pyramid of excellence must be recognised and secured well into future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much.
and there are requirements to bring it up to meet those needs. It's never been truer that if you have any interest whatsoever in singing, there is out there, within your, you know, within striking distance, uh, in your locality, there is a choir for you. And that's it's never been truer uh, uh, than it is now. And here's the but. What I wonder is, and I'm not wondering especially, things to really say, and when the work we've done on this, and this is not, I'm not trying to inject a note of gloom, I'm trying to inject a note of caution. What I wonder is the extent to which those, those, those choirs and choral activities are actually sustainable. Um, and we do get very unpleasant stories from time to time, not common, and particularly true in, 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 uh, in youth choirs, where you get choirs springing up, getting terribly excited about their existence, and then because the infrastructure hasn't been put in place, because the choir is, has just been started by some inspirational figure or by some highly enthusiastic, well-meaning, uh, but maybe not that competent person, uh, the end result is that after a year or two of making make people very happy and very excited, the thing fizzles out. And this is particularly worrying when it happens with regard to young people, obviously. And the, the unfortunate syndrome there is that, you know, um, uh, excited parents start up something to, to give little Johnny an outlet. The choir starts, and little Johnny's voice breaks, or, or, or he loses interest, um, and there isn't a little Jane. Uh, um, and the, you know, so the parent walks away, and the, the choir fizzles out. And this, this happens. So my note of caution really is: if we're going to jump on this bandwagon, and bandwagon's a bit of a derogatory term, I don't mean that. If we're going to, if we're going to um, subscribe to this movement. Um, let's make sure we do so in a way where, where we set the choirs up properly uh, and we've actually got something that we, we think can be sustained off into the future. So that's, that's the perhaps less controversial thing that I just wanted to point out. The second, um, the second thing I want to talk a little bit about, uh, which is a bit, um, a bit more controversial, is that a lot of the things that, that Susie said, I think, because, uh, were, were, were focused very much on, on a traditional classical music, Western classical infrastructure, which we know and understand and love in, in this country. And there is nothing wrong with that. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I sang 10 years of the London Symphony Chorus, performed 50 classical concerts in this very building, about 50 meters that way. Um, I, I am a classical musician by, by inclination, by, um, by primary interest, and by what I, what I listen to most. But I do, I, I do really recognise that the vast majority of young people in, in, in this country today don't have, don't share those inclinations. I think what's great about the current role scene, as far as adults is concerned, is that it's becoming easier and easier for people who don't share a classical music uh, uh, inclination to sing. I still question whether singing in schools is properly set up in order to, um, uh, uh, to reflect effectively huge diversity of communities that exist in, in, uh, in this country. Um, and I'm still concerned that we have too much emphasis on formal musical education that goes on in schools, and not enough emphasis within school education, within musical education schools, of actually performing. It's a lot about learning, there's a lot about understanding, there's a lot about listening, and there's a bit about performing, and it's getting better. But I still fear that the, that, you know, the syndrome that we want to forget, which someone's called bedroom syndrome, and, and, and the, the key, the key um, exponent of this, and the most successful ever exponent of it, as far as anyone can tell, was Daniel Beckenfield. Do you remember him? Sort of kind of dropped off the scene a bit now. But about 10 years ago, he had a number one hit, which was created by himself in his bedroom. Okay, and I think that's terrible, actually. I think it's awful that he felt the need to create music in his bedroom, rather than outside with other people. And that was clearly because the kind of music that he wanted to create was not being reflected in his school or, or, or elsewhere in his community. And I think that's a real shame. You can't effectively play the oboe any better. I mean, you can, but it you know, would be just you playing the oboe. What you have to do to play the oboe is you have to go outside and play with other people. But, but in modern genres of music, that's a completely different story. You've got electronic equipment which can create an entire sound for you in your bedroom. And I think it's a real shame that the community. That education and the, and the outer world, outside world of community uh, does not reflect often enough people's needs to make that kind of music out there. Sometimes they want to do it in a solitary way because they're teenagers, you know, I understand. But also it would be really nice if they had additional outlets. So I'm, I worry 
bit about, still a bit, about how mainstream music is perceived uh, as, uh, you know, as coming from that classical music tradition. Uh, and uh, I really think that we could do something about that uh, if we try very hard. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm really going wildly in the territory of being devil's advocate here. I'm really sure I believe what I just said, but I just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> I just want to throw that out because I think it's really important we think about it and, and talk about it because I, I do think it's vitally important. So those are the two points that I wanted to raise. I could go on this forever. I could talk about those other things, but I'll shut up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm not convinced that choirs can lend what people are about to as broken Britain, but I am convinced of the huge benefits both singing as an individual and singing as a collective experience can have. Choirs bring people together, they create new dialogues, foster new understandings between different types of people, and create a sense of identity and belonging. So in short, singing is a catalyst for positive new experiences and positive new opportunities, which for some people wouldn't otherwise exist in their, in their lives. Can you leave me in the back? Yeah. So, choirs are made up of groups of people who want, need, and love to sing. I'm going to take a slightly different attack. I'm going to move that the teaching of music through singing should be made a necessary and integral part of the national curriculum for all primary age school children and that it should have the same stat status in the curriculum as English and maths. Research has shown that music reaches and activates parts of the brain that no other subject does. I always like to add, not even highly. Um, <laughs> <but> I, um, <laughs> um, it enhances learning in all subjects and enables children to participate better in all activities. It stimulates the mind, soul, and body of the child in one very positive activity. The fact that it is so powerful in the helping of children with so many learning difficulties where everything else has failed is proof enough. Only yesterday I was launching Jolly Music as a uh, music curriculum to 27 primary school teachers in Enfield. And one teacher spoke of her own seven-year-old son who is very dyslexic and cannot read a single sentence without enormous difficulties. However, just recently, he has decided to sing what he's reading. And the reading now comes out here as he sings it, fluently, well punctuated, and totally intelligent. <coughs> I feel sorry for the family, he evidently knows his son, but it, it bears an important point about the singing being part of the brain not connected to speech. And that there are there is marvelous research, I think it's Paul Robinson, the original, well, the leader of the um, uh, what the quartet, I forget, the teaching history quartet, who researched music of the mind, and people who had brain damage from an accident, who couldn't speak anymore, could actually speak through singing. So this singing is something that is very powerful indeed. There is no subject that fulfills the emotional the intellectual, the physical, the spiritual, and the oral in one activity, so well as music through singing. It unites any number of people in one unified positive activity. Nothing else can even begin to match this. Musical children are fulfilled human beings, and music mends souls. Teaching music through singing is not expensive. And is the best musical instrument, singing is the best musical instrument of all. The human voice is used, it's the first instrument. All other instruments are an extension of our ability to sing. This then opens up the door for children to learn instruments, which are, after all, an extension, as I say, of our ability to sing, if they wish to and if they are suited to. Singing in choirs is the most wonderful thing and should be the culmination of good practice. Teach children music through singing. At the age of eight, I joined the cathedral choir in Truro, and I'm honest, I never looked back. My best mate in the choir before we moved to another school was Roger Taylor, who later became the drummer of the Queen. Uh, so it did him no harm. Uh, there is ample proof in the media of how workplace choirs are having a real beneficial effect on the workforce, from shop floor to senior management. It is essential to catch children young and give them the means of enjoying all types of choral singing. Those of us who sing and conduct and teach music know that singing really does mend broken souls. So that's 
one for us. That we can discuss later. Let us put singing where it belongs as part of the growing up experience so that all society benefits in the long run. Thank you. Here we are, like, top musicians, and everyone's got perfect timing. <laughs> the final was here, our, our Amazon musician gets a lot of care. We push the making exactly. speaking into the mic. Right. Right, uh, I have a, a slightly different perspective than everybody else on the choir. Um, and I belong to an amateur choir. Um, that sings in Durham Cathedral, that was a great attraction for me, and it's something that I've taken on much later in life. I have to endorse all the points that the, the previous speaker said, it does enhance your life, it's a fantastic thing to do. Um, and, uh, but what I do want to actually concentrate on is what I think of as the, the television choir, but I think the functional choir, um, that, that uh, idea, and the kind of choir that I belong to. Just to give you a bit of background on my choir, it's about, it's, it's, we just celebrated our golden anniversary, so it's been since 1962, uh, longer than I have, um, and it's, it, so it's a, it's a sustainable choir. It has about 150 members. Um, it's, we do classical music from the 16th to the 21st century, and one of the great attractions for me has been learning uh, uh, new pieces that I have never come across and uh, really didn't, didn't think too much of. I'm, I'm still uh, on the board of a John Brother. Uh, but at least, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of been introduced to the, that sort of music. And it, it, for me, it's a, it, it's a didactic experience. It's, it's learning, um, and uh, I think it's, it's a very good thing. Um, we have ages of about 15 to 94 as our eldest member. Um, and uh, so it's, it is intergenerational in the, in the parts that, in the points that I think Tessa was making. It's absolutely true that you relate to people um, in a different way. I'm, I'm a great keener on the choirs. However, then we come to the choir phenomenon, I suppose the functional or television choir. Um, and much as I think there are, there are good parts of that, very good drama, um, uh, the, the television choir, I do think it's, it's important to, to say that the voluntary private choir that I belong to, that type of choir, is different than the television choir that we have. Um, just to give you a bit of research, because I, I was fascinated by this. By the way, I, I emailed you once ago and asked how many people were uh, in choirs in the UK. Um, and it's a very difficult, the, the research was quite difficult to do the first. Um, but I did find some really good in, in, in information from the US, which it, it, they, they have slightly. Uh, so there's some British and some US um, uh, research. So in this country, about 500,000 people, according to Tonsil, which I forget if that's the end. There's the ongoing singing liaison. That's why I couldn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so about 500,000, and that sounds very approximate, but in the US it's 23.5 million uh, of singing choirs. And what's fascinating about this, it, it, it comes out roughly 8% of the population. Now this is by far the most important way that people interact with the arts in this country and in the United States. No other form of interaction, participation in the arts saying it even comes close to this participation level. So um, there's a huge amount of people involved. About 60% are female. Obviously, it's a bit of an attraction. Um, but uh, <laughs> it, it tends to be more female. It, it, some I've seen is 73% in, in some. Uh, tend to be well-educated in general. Um, tend to be political participants, particularly in the US. 93% uh, vote, which is a very, very high. Uh, so there's an element of participation in there. 50% um, of the people that have been in choirs, and in the US stuff that I've seen, had piano lessons as children. So that really, it backs up the point that you're making, that musical education stays with you. And, and, and so a, a lot of people are, are trying to uh, um, improve, musically improve, by coming on to these choirs. And the reasons that they give are also very interesting. Uh, joy of singing and uh, coming together for a, uh, in, in music, in a project, in a musical project. Of course, you can sing in the shower, but it's, it's not quite the same thing. So it's the coming together that's very important. And, but the third and fourth reasons both have to do with musical improvement. 
that they actually want to improve their musical knowledge, they want to experience new musical uh, ex experiences. I think this is to do with the sustainability issue. If you continue to challenge people, it keeps them coming back uh, and they learn. So I think there's a very important element there. Now, in terms of if uh, hopefully you've all been looking at the choir, uh, Garrett Malone's a very interesting uh, uh, choir project. And what I find about the choir is that it's, um, it's a different sort of event because it's very prescriptive. And I'm not, I, I would actually say, I suppose the main point of what I'm trying to say today is that this, the prescription that we see with many of these choirs actually undermines the type of uh, voluntary private organizations uh, like my own. I think there's this idea, it's, it's uh, the Gareth Malone's the choir uh, exists to further a sort of public goal, it's, it's to get these workplaces together, it's to sort of facilitate all of this. Um, it's, uh, it's about social engineering in a way. If you've watched uh, some of these, they, they had um, uh, the managers brought in, not because they had very strong voices, because they actually didn't. Uh, the managers that I saw didn't have particularly strong voices, but it's here at the sort of uh, bringing these people in so that you have the top to bottom uh, kind of workforce. You had the director of Clean Water, which I thought was such a great title. Big King for new there, isn't it? <laughs> Go for the water into the homes of the street. Which, uh, so, uh, but he had to be brought in, despite the fact that he had a pretty weak voice in my estimation. I'm not an expert, but, uh, uh, as the other panel members are. But, um, and it, it was also, it's, it's sold for health benefits, it's sold for uh, all of these very different social reasons. And these are all fairly prescriptive things. This is somebody telling me to be in a choir because it's good for me, not me coming to the choir to self-improve. There's a real difference between uh, those two goals, and I think it's, it's worth us uh, focusing on that. And um, I think our choir is a choir for collective purpose. Interestingly, we, we, don't, uh, we decide who are members in the membership policy. We hire the conductors. Uh, we pay, we actually, uh, we actually pay um, well, we don't pay for audience members to come. But what we did is we subsidized classical music for people. The amount it costs us to sing in Durham Cathedral with a full orchestra and, and wonderful soloists, it makes the price of the ticket. Uh, we lose money every time, but we're very happy to do that. And I think that is a role for choirs, but for private uh, organizations like my own, <coughs> to, to actually promote classical music in that way, to make it accessible um, by, by actually doing that. So, yes, I will finish, I, 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 will, I will take up your challenge from, um, about classical music, because I think uh, classical music, and I come as somebody late, fairly late on to classical music, I didn't have a classical music background, but to me, it's the most important music, and I think in terms of sustainability, that's the only way you're going to be able to uh, actually challenge people, get them doing interesting enough music, um, and to learn all the time. I mean, don't forget that choir members come in order to learn. And the amount of uh, self-improvement you can do by singing Fat Bottom Girls uh, is, is very limited, whereas if you come to um, classical music, you will forever be challenged. And I do think it's, it's a bizarre idea. Oh, is that a red card? Yeah. I swore I did. No, 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 no. Yes, I will finish just by saying that, that, to, uh, that I think the idea of teaching children contemporary music is a bizarre one. We are there to teach classical music to children. Children are not going to learn very much about us if we don't te teach rap. Uh, people are going to laugh at me if I'm trying to do that. So I'll finish on that. Round of applause for that. We're, we're pushing the time, and I really want to get your views and, and, and questions to the audience. Um, so I, I really like to take it out to you as quickly as possible. We all said enough. Okay, fine. <laughs> so I'll take a round of uh, questions and then bring it back to our speakers. Uh, there's a mic coming around. So the, the, the lady next to you. Uh, yeah, that, that, that'll be fine. There's a common thread that runs through this session and the session before, which was on prize winning literature. So in the previous session, uh, the panellists talked about how um, the, num the number of writers is completely flooding out the number of readers. 
Uh, and for me, uh, the, 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 the question that's hovering uh, above this session is who is watching, who is consuming um, those, those choirs? Uh, and is it actually just about individual, is, is it just an individuated trend? Is it more therapeutic uh, than having uh, gen genuine cultural qualities? I think there was a woman behind you in the black cap. Um, I am part of a women's choir in Manchester, mostly young women aged about 18 to 30 odd. And I would like to. One, one contradict what you said about the uh, qualities of teaching modern music. Um, we make our own, well not me because I can't do them, but the people who quiet do their own arrangements of modern songs, pop music, indie music. Um, for example, we did a Regina Spector song, which was one of the hardest things I've ever had to sing in my life. And everyone else agreed. And it was fantastic to sing the music that we like, that is challenging. Um, but, I would say that the thing is that interests me is about women's choirs in particular. What do you think it is that makes women want to get together and sing together? I know why we do it, and a lot of us identify as feminists, and it's a very supportive, non-competitive choir that's free and you don't have to audition. I think those are the big parts of it for me. But I just wonder what you thought in general of that phenomenon. Can you keep your hands up for a second? Um, the lady at the back who I recognise is Jean Nichols, who is the 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 woman who got me singing. So, <laughs> well, big welcome to you. I am. Um, however, I, I fear we are heading towards an environment in which singing is the equivalent of eating properly. It's yeah. not just good for you. I think we should stop worrying about what people get out of it. We all get out of it what we want to get out of it, and that is a very individual thing. The extraordinary thing is that that is from a common process. <coughs> But we should stop being so prescriptive about what you will get out of it. Um, the gentleman over there, and then the woman next to me. I just wanted to um, well, try to formulate a, a, a question around uh, two things that came out from the panel, and that's uh, Robin's point about our. Uh, uh, these choirs sustainable and Susie's point about um, functional singing. Um, because as well as um, singing on football terraces, there, there used to be uh, pub singers all around the night uh, from Birmingham. There's lots of working class Irish pubs um, all around Birmingham and you would have people going around uh, pub singers and everybody would join in uh, Friday, Saturday night, lots of alcohol consumed obviously. Um, now, there are, there are many reasons why that doesn't happen. Now, one of them being legislation, it's, uh, you know, it's now illegal to sing in a club unless the club's got a public entertainment license, which would cost them about 25 grand. Um, but there's also, I think, something much more intangible um, that's, that's changed. And it's, it's surely about the relations between people, that those people who were in the club, who were up for uh, having a bit of a singing song and, uh, and lots of beer were, you know, saw uh, that they had something in, in common. They probably all drank together every Saturday night. There were, there were cultural connections. Um, and so I wonder whether it's, uh, we just don't have the same relationships anymore. So we all, we all know about uh, the, the discussions about broken, broken Britain and broken communities. But it, but it does seem to be that it's something uh, in society that's changed. And so whether, whatever we want to um, uh, prescribe to solve that problem or that, and whether we think choirs are able to do that or, or whether we don't, surely we do need to understand what it is that's changed first. Okay, great. So after the woman there, I think I, I, I've got the answer. We'll come back in for uh, some responses from the uh, from our speakers and then we'll go for uh, um, I just wanted to pick up on the, uh, what Tessa and Kevin said about um, choirs in the workplace. Um, I know there's been a, a tradition of workplace music groups for quite a long time. I know that ICI have a, a brass band um, and things like that. But I think um, what concerns me at the moment is that there is a um, something that goes on in workplaces about employee engagement, which I think if you um, really love and value what choirs are. Um, I 
I would be worried about how that gets um, tainted and drawn into those issues. Um, for instance, I think the uh, fact that um, choirs um, have the idea of cooperation, I think that can be manipulated, really. Um, there is also this idea of um, hygiene factors, which means that you go to work not to be paid because you enjoy all these other things uh, like seeing the quality there. Um, and also, I think the other thing that workplaces um, do in terms of employee engagement is this uh, we're valuing everybody's contribution. Um, that tends to be, um, in my experience, a substitute for decision making. So, there's all these problems I think that exist in workplaces and in thinking about um, keeping the employees happy, um, which could possibly um, <coughs> be tainting the, the notion of being acquired. Um, one of the things that I, I also worry about is that it gets substituted for um, what was around a couple of years ago, which was we'll get everybody um, a health check and they can all count their cholesterol levels. Um, and that you get volunteered into this in inverted commas um, with an implication that if you don't join in, there's something wrong with you. And I think as people who want to promote singing, that, that is something to be um, cautious about. Great. Thank you very much. I had told you some tough questions from before. Um, have you got start off, Susie, you want to respond to anything you think about? Yeah. Um, I think you can't hear. <laughs> What's your question about the women? Why is it that there are more women who might wish to, to participate in the Well, I think it's a really interesting one. I think part of it is the trauma of men's voice, voice when they break. And that that trauma can stay with men for a long time. Secondly is the, is the sort of uh, cultural, um, uh, how men and women tend to group with each other. And uh, men group often around sport. And, and so I think, but, but having said that, in my experience, when men become part of a choir, their commitment is equal. And um, so, so actually when they're there, there is no real differentiation between the two. So I think it, it is slightly cultural in some So I think women's only choirs that are split, properly split, rather than ones that are mixed. But yeah, I'm kind of seeing Yeah. In terms of the pub scene, um, I'm, I think um, I probably wasn't, and I still probably haven't found the right way to describe what I, what I view as this functional scene, which is not a recreational pursuit, it is actually a need. And I think we've, we've evolved so far through society, so far away from the need to sing. Um, and if you go to uh, some societies where, or cultures where singing is, is still there because it is a, it is a need and not a Choice. Um, that's how I would view um, uh, recre uh, functional singing. So nobody's gone to the football terraces and said, let's sing together now. It's almost become as a sort of a need to differentiate yourself from your opponent. Um, some very interesting contributions. I, I, I mean, I, rather like Jean, I think I don't really buy the, the functional recreational um, distinction. I think it's much more of a spectrum. Uh, I think at one end you've got uh, a completely bottom-up activity of singing, which, which, young, which young people in particular, but everybody, uh, just does. You know, they get together and they do it. Um, and actually, football, football choirs would be a very good example of that, football, football terrorist choirs. Uh, at the other end, you've got something which is totally top-down and opposed. So I'm thinking of an example of like that might be the uh, Alzheimer's Society Singing for the Brain Initiative, and there are a couple others like that. Where, where, where the Alzheimer's Society considered that actually setting up a choir is good for people with Alzheimer's. People with Alzheimer's may, may not have actually, certainly in the case of being having advanced Alzheimer's, may not actually have the decision making powers to decide whether it's good for them or not. The Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's Society has decided he does a good job. However, it's not compulsory, and we seem to have got into this mindset that, that, that there appears to be some notion of choirs out there that people must sing in, whether it's in a workplace or in a, you know, a football terrace or, or in, a, in, a, in an Alzheimer's group. Let me say, most of singing must be compulsory. It's one of the few genuinely voluntary activities left in, left in the world, and one sings in a state as they want to. Um, and, uh, and I think I, I really take Jean's point that, that actually, you know, we should stop worrying about this. 
What we need to ensure is that there are singing groups out there for people who want to sing. <clears throat> we're looking at this through the running of the telescope. We're not trying to impose singing groups on people who don't want to sing, or even sort of don't even think they want to sing, or think they want to sing that don't really know. We're looking at, at trying to ensure that the, the, our society exists in order to give people outlets to do something which I think we all agree is highly natural for human beings and highly um, instinctive for human beings. And if they don't have that, that variety of outlets, many people will be disappointed. And that and that could, you know, that could indeed range from I mean it's very important to have a choir in the workplace. That's really important actually, because there are plenty of people who work so bloody hard. They, they don't have time, or they think they don't have time, they don't have the energy to sing outside the workplace, so it's great to be able to give them an outlet within the workplace. It's really important if it helps people with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, to sing, which we all know, which, 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 which the research has done in a couple of ways that it does. It's important that such choirs exist. If people want to sing on the full terms, it's important that they can. If people want to sing you know, in one of Susie's choirs, fantastic. You know. We're looking into the wrong end of the telescope. So that, 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 that's one thing I would say. And that is why I have a problem with putting classical music on a pedestal. That's the only reason. Not because, because uh, and the, the, the first lady's uh, comment about genuine cultural, uh, what you said, ge genuine cultural reasons, that scares me. That really scares me, okay? Because I don't, you know, I think, I, I think to say that the, that the only type of singing that works is the cathedral choir, or the people who are doing it for the most fine, possible, genuine musical reasons. That really worries me. And I'd, like, I'd just like to remind us, us that the word culture derives from, I think, the Latin word, I think, Greek, can't remember my Latin, the word for growth, okay? And it's about individual growth, and it's about society's growth. And seeing and promote both individual and community's growth. Uh, and I don't think it matters whether it's classical or anything else. Okay, but uh, Tessa, do you want to come back on anything um, specifically the, the work? Yeah, oh, well, the lady um, talks about who actually benefits other than the individual in the choir. Was that, that was, to get the gist of your point, that who actually benefits other than the I was just saying, do it too prescriptive about yeah. the best it's all to be. Okay, sorry. But I think um, the lady, sorry, what's your name? Yes. No, it's more that I'm, I'm troubled by the idea of. Um, well, be the writer, I'm squirreling away at home writing, um, and nobody is like sort of reading, or but fewer people are reading. Um, those people are going out to choirs and singing to an empty room. Well, um, if you take the, if, you, if you take that in its totality, it's a, it's a bit depressing. Um, really. yes. there's, something, there's something not right about that scenario. I think in order to, for a choir to create, have sustainability and have longevity, something that Robin points out, then the performance platforms are key. We work closely with leading arts organisations like City London Festival, Acapella Festival, to create public performances. And that's what keeps the momentum going. So there's one outlet there in terms of the choirs coming out of their office. It's not something that they just do internally. And the families come along, and also creates for some of the adults who haven't sung before. It's giving them a new education for music, so they can then create, help their children practice, help their children lead music, something that was previously confined to a practice room, a lonely activity for a young child, can then become a shared activity, creating a new dialogue. So I think there are far more reaching out or benefits that reach further than just the individuality the individual experience of singing in the choir. Um, um, I'd like to pick up on the point about uh, audiences. I don't think it actually matters whether a choir sings for an audience or not. I think choirs tend to love singing for their own enjoyment of singing the great pieces of music. Well, whatever the music is, there can be different kinds of music. Uh, I don't think that matters. Uh, I think the pub singing is great. I was brought up, drag, brought up in Cornwall where there was Moody and Sankey singing, him singing in the Methodist church. There were the lovely male voice choirs. Uh, at least once a month in the cathedral we'd hear a male voice choir singing. They came just because they loved singing. They weren't, I don't think they were really worried about whether there's an audience or not. I actually run a Kodai choir in London, but we deliberately don't do concerts. We just get together to sing lovely repertoire for fun of it. And that's why people come. 
Um, so I'm not too concerned about the audience, though of course if you're trying to raise money to hire an orchestra <laughs> and all that, then, then you do need an audience. And let's face it, it is wonderful to go and hear a really good performance of something. Uh, I, 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 as it were, believe in both camps. I like to sing for an audience, because I'm a performer, but also I love to get together with a group of friends and sing some magicals with a bottle of wine, you know, at home. And that, that is equally enjoyable. Um, that's about it. No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, just very interestingly on the, on the workplace choirs issue, but one of the interesting things about our choir is that we're all anonymous. In that, as soon as we go into the choir, we forget what we do for a living. We forget the administrative jobs, whatever. And people are fairly equal in that sense. There is a sort of natural equality to the choir, um, that whereby you know you're not a father or a, a, this or that or the other thing. You are a tenor, a soprano, a, you know, all of the various different. You know, and you're part of a musical project uh, to to put together some beautiful music. Um, and that's, that's what you're there to do. And this is what I was trying to emphasize of the difference between this sort of, uh, and, and I, I don't get the functional kind of thing. I'm not entirely uh, certain of what that means. I suspect what, what you're talking about is, is the very ancient idea that a, a culture had to express itself. Music didn't used to be a participatory thing. It used to be uh, an expression of who you were. And, and uh, points made in Ivan Hewitt's book, which is uh, really important to have a look at. And um, so I think what I get concerned about is, is when people start telling you this is why you should come together and they start highlighting all of these social differences and trying to engineer people from different social classes together, it doesn't work unless it, it works organically. And that's what the, the sort of difference I was trying to make between uh, the uh, workplace crimes that are prescriptive, you must. And if you look at Jamie Eager, not Jamie, uh, uh, Gareth Malone, you can see Freudian said there. That uh, he he's, he goes to all of these water workers who dig holes for a living. Come on, guys, do it for the company. And I know what I would have said if I was the one of those water workers. <laughs> and they did basically say that. Um, and it, you know, when you're when you're doing that, it doesn't work. But I think it's the voluntary nature of this that that is the most important. But close to the TV show is very different. So obviously, the way we work is completely voluntary. And there's no descriptors at all. You know, you can really encourage people. Requires there coming on with a new black word and that there's no auditions, but the TV cameras I think make it a very different approach. Okay, so I'm going to wind my tongue here because I want to say things. We've got 15 minutes left and lots of hands. Okay, uh, the lady with the glasses over there, <coughs> then the guy in the red jacket, uh, then the woman in front of me, and then the man with the camera. And then I'll try and get to move foot. So try and keep it brief. Okay, I mean, it seems to me that there are lots of different reasons why people want to sing together. Um, Participating in the choir, I've been going to sing a singing group. I just want to sing with other people. I didn't want to have to perform. I did have to perform because that's the kind of the, the conclusion, and it was fine. But I just, you know, singing with other people, having fun, that was it. And I think that's a perfectly good reason for um, wanting to sing in the choir. Um, I just wanted to think about kids for a minute, though, because actually I've had choir with my daughter who as it happens, hasn't got a bad voice. But within schools, it seems to me that the, a lot of the singing that happens within schools takes on the kind of the therapeutic um, angle. And I think that, you know, that, that singing for therapeutic reasons is absolutely good and fine, as long as it is for people who need some kind of therapy. And actually, not all school kids need therapy for, for various um, issues that, you know, whether, whether it was the thing about reading, the, the problems with reading and so on, that, that's all quite good to sing for that reason. But, but when it gets kind of mixed up, so all school kids, you know, it is about participation, that, that it's good for them, it's good for them to have to stand up together and sing. I don't think that, that's a good enough reason within schools and for young people to have to, to, to sing. Now, as it happens, my daughter has got into the London Youth Choir, which I'm, I'm very happy. But what worries me about that now is that, the, you know, if there are alternative um, reasons for that choir other than getting a really brilliant classical music education and learning to sing in a fabulous choir of people who, you know, who auditioned, then that slightly worries me because the reason that I think that's so brilliant is that, you know, that's about a proper good classical choral education or experience. And I think that when the, when the reasons for 
singing together get get meshed, then then it becomes problematic. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Try and keep your remarks brief. Yeah, I find it really disturbing that um, such a fantastic tradition to the choral music is reduced to such banalities as make you feel better, school, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and with Kevin, I think that the only music that should be sang in choral music, uh, or choir music, is classical. And why I say that is because you can, it's not a question of singing what you like. You know, kids don't know. That. The whole reason they go to school is to learn about things they don't know about. And uh, just bowing down to them and getting them to play rap or one of the other choir is not, is not good. Secondly, it sort of equates pop music with classical music. I've loved choral music from, from, for years, uh, I'm not in a choir. But I think that the reason why it's important to maintain this, uh, the, the, to maintain the standard that, we've, we, that choral, choir should have classical music is <coughs> because this is not just an expression of, like, this is what I like. This is an ex classical music, like any other art, represents the expression of humanity and a whole history with that. And that is what makes a choir great. Uh, we've seen the traditions. Uh, England had, had a wonderful tradition of uh, choirs uh, in, uh, before the Second World War. Um, and it's not just religious. It's not just religious expressions. Uh, in Germany, in the Weimar Republic, you had Schoenberg, and uh, you had uh, Hans Eisler writing choral pieces for workers and societies. There were 300,000 uh, socialist uh, choruses in Germany at the Weimar Republic. And I think one of the things that said that you made a point, which, was really, which I think is really telling, that uh, you said this joining of the choir creates a, a sense of identity and belonging. And it gets back to the, the, the point you were making there. The thing about the choir is that the choir is there to explain. The choir comes together because there already is a, a, a belonging and a sense. What you have here is the choir is sort of like trying to create something which doesn't exist. But that makes sense. Okay. Um, can I have a show of hands? Uh, I see the lady here, the gentleman there. Please keep your mask very as possible. We'll go over here. Thank you. Um, one of the panel mentioned about singing in schools. I don't know if anyone else is as old as me, possibly not. I took, I, I took part in singing together at school when I was in uh, junior school, and now I've got a fabulous back catalogue in my head of folk singers, songs, sea shanties. If ever I'm chained to a radiator like Terry Wayne was, I've got, the, uh, I've got a terrific back catalogue in my head of all my culture way back. Secondly, I recently volunteered as a guinea pig at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital where they're doing in Birmingham, where they're doing research. And they, they did a, a lung test, and they said to me, are you a swimmer or a singer? <laughs> so that was interesting. And also, I think this surgeon choirs is something to do with a society that is fed up of doing solo stuff on their computers, on their phones. Who wants to be human? Uh, right, so the, the couple at the front, and then the guy behind, them, and then we'll get to the room. Oh, I miss this gentleman there. Yeah, after you, I'll we'll get back. Um, I've been in the two workplace-based work choirs for about almost eight years now, and both of them used to operate all year round, but now one is only from October to December to incorporate rehearsals, remembrance day service, and then the council is in December. So what I've found is due to various headcount exercises in the workplace, our numbers have diminished quite dramatically. And the sustainability issue comes from losing people and having the same workload. And I was just wondering if you had any ideas on how we can overcome that. Yeah, can I answer that? Uh, very briefly, because I'm really happy here, but I'd like to keep. Yeah, something which companies come to our support and have their own requirements for exactly that period, which is up to Christmas, and they want to make an annual, um, annual activity. So we create summer, summer concerts in January, the Acapella festivals in things like this. And I do think that you know, it's descriptive that people can opt not to perform in the choir when they're performing. But 
but from my experience that having the performances to, it does galvanize the choir and give people a huge sense of achievement for them perform in front of people before. So for right. us, performances are really at the heart of the choirs and often they're informal, it leads to your colleague performing in the working all day in the morning, but having those little performances scattered across the town and structure, it does, it does, yeah, it does definitely We've got like 10 minutes, including summing up, so I think we should just take as many questions as possible and then we'll get the uh, other speakers to. One little observation very quickly my wife and daughter were singing choirs, quite eminent choirs, as we've all been before. Speak up. So, um, the half a million is a small figure, but it's actually a pretty good figure because one of the main reasons why the USA has so many people singing is you've got 20 to 40 percent of that population go to church on Sundays, and that's the reason. We, and I feel more so it's particularly good that we've got half a million because we're not like, for example, uh, Russia or Lithuania, where I recently went to a song and dance festival where they had a choir of 15,000 people in a football stadium. We don't have that, but I think it, it, it is building up very well. Church attendances are now down to under a million, um, as you know, called the Church of England. And uh, so, well done. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman over there and the two ladies <coughs> behind. Briefly. Really quickly, back to Bobby. Your point about doesn't it, does it matter whether it's classical music or not, I think that frames it the wrong way around because I think the problem is, is that classical music is actually seen as absurd of a particular group in society. And it's not seen as relevant to the majority of people, it seems too complicated, too difficult. And the challenge, and I've worked in a school where they're teaching this, oh, the challenge you face is actually making classical music accessible to a wider audience. And in that respect, the play almost does matter. Great. This is just a short question, which is, um, I suppose I'm just what Kevin said about his choir paying for the choir um, <coughs> to exist, really, in order for it to do anything else, you have to pay for yourself. So I was wondering what, what the panel would say, whether you, you think it's better to, for the choirs to fund themselves or to be publicly funded, especially when public funding these days always comes with the strings. Uh, well, I, 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 allow me just to answer from a reasonably logical perspective. It is almost unheard of these days for choirs to be, certainly amateur choirs anyway, to be publicly funded. So your, your question is almost irrelevant, because <laughs> uh, it ain't going to happen anyway. And, and you're quite right that, uh, 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 you know, I mean, I like eating out. Uh, I wouldn't expect the government to pay me to do that. Uh, the, the difference is, I think, that a number of choirs are, uh, are actually performing a public service in that they are, they are putting on concerts and events in their communities. And that's the, where the question, rather than just paying people to sing, the question is, do you as a local authority or as the government want to actually promote cultural and musical activity in your area? If you do, the vast majority of events that are put on in this country are put on by amateur groups. Okay. The vast majority. Yeah. Um, so I think they're going to be our last two speakers. So please keep it brief. It's just a very good question about um, the sustainability. Um, I can understand the obvious advantages and um, reasons why the majority of choirs need to be sustainable. Um, but, but also, possibly the flip side of there being lots of um, short term projects with relatively short, short life cycle choirs, <coughs> is that not possibly why we have such a variety of eclectic mix of choirs available? Because it gives people that introduction to singing and they can then go through their own things. Okay, brilliant. So um, I think that one potentially interesting thing that could come out of this rise in amateur choirs is if they grow and start being actually taken seriously in the music community, is the professional musicians could learn something new about how classical music should be interpreted. Now, I say this as someone with a very, not I'd say, non traditional background who then went into choral singing. And what I discovered, and I think this is true, is that people who don't grow up in the classical tradition can bring a lot of new and innovative and exciting things into interpreting this music, which historically and especially now in society is only performed and learned by a relatively few people. 
So I think that's one of the most exciting directions that can music can go in the future. Lovely, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry about the managing to take everyone to take everybody. We've got five minutes, so we've got that mini tea. But thank you so much for your contribution. It's been a really stimulating discussion so far. Do you want to? Yeah, on the, on the subject of capitalism, I disagree with both my co-panelists on this. I agree with you that capitalism is a it is neither something we should be apologising for in any way, nor is it something that should be viewed as the only credible music that provides the kind of challenge that uh, is uh, developed self-improvement. Uh, um, and I'll sum this up with a, an amazing uh, uh, story of uh, a young uh, man who went to, went to a focus group of teenagers. And um, we, would start, we were embarking on a programme that would engage young audiences in this music. And this current AJ, it was a big, big black youth with a hoodie and everything. He shouted at his, put his rucksack down and said, OK, so what, what's all this about? So I played him a bit of the math of passion. And he listened to it for a while and he said, and I said, what do you think? He said, oh man, this is the mother of all music. <laughs> and then he continued to say why it was that the adults in the community of all the Nantians around him. And this music is never brought to us, he said, because adults are afraid that we're going to be put off by us, etc., etc. Possible are populated by people who define their sense of, of uh, elitism through their choice of classical music, etc., etc. But for that young man, that was incredible music, and he'd never heard anything like it before. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Brian, you have a Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure, though, I, you won't be able to prove this, but I'm, I'm prepared to, to, to take a guess that I have something more classical than anyone else in this room. <laughs> At my age, and with the and with the London Symphony Chorus, when we uh, when we famously did twelve concerts uh, in one month in this building, uh, it's a, it's an absolutely huge number, and they're pretty much all classical. And I think the debate is in the end a fairly sterile one, as Susie has just has just pointed out. But I, I do think we we really need we really need to be very very careful about it, if, if only because the definition of the word classical. Uh, you know, are you sort of, what, 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 is, what, is, what is the chish's the song? Is that, a, is that a piece of classical music? Is it a piece of jazz? Or is it a, is, is, is it a bunch of Hebrew folk songs? You know, I, I, don't know, I don't know how you would interpret that. And there are whole loads of other uh, grey areas like that. So I, I, I think in the end it's a bit of a sterile debate. Uh, I, I don't, or I, or I will never agree, however, however, however hard you push me, is that any form of music in any culture can be set on a pedestal as better, you know, better than any other. That is something that I will never sign up to. In, in, in one particular culture, you might well feel that way, but then pop over the road to somewhere else, France or Africa or, 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 or China or Japan, and then you won't get an agreement from it. And I don't think we have the right, as Western classical music people, to set up any form of culture as better than any other. Tessa, any closing remarks? Very, very good. Right. Kevin? Right. You know, anyone should be 
it should join a choir for any reason that they wish, but it should be their wish to join a choir. It shouldn't be because the government has said this is a great thing, or it shouldn't be because it's part of their five-day uh, or, or anything else like that. That's why they should. So, and whatever music they want to sing, you know, who would, who would say differently? Uh, in terms of policy, I completely agree with David here. Where you should prescribe music is with school children, and they should force school children to learn music in middle school and in senior school. And they should force them to learn classical music because it's much more difficult. Uh, and it's, it, it's the most appropriate teachable music that exists. Just like you should force boys and girls to sing, sit together and they pretend they don't like what they really do. Uh, it's, it's, you should force classical music as well. And singing in choirs, I think, is a great way to do it. Uh, very last point, um, classical music, it's the only real universal music. It's the only real music that's divorced specifically from the player of the music. Um, and that is not simply a function of the actual uh, player of the music. It's written down. Uh, it's fungible in terms of all of its various different members are able to be interconnected. It is, that's what makes it uh, a better music. Um, I'm not saying that all the other musics aren't, uh, you know, you can't appreciate the great things about them, but, but classical music is the only universal one that we'll have to discuss. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>